prospecting for didgeridoos. In among the firewood. We shall see what we shall see.
Got one. Then of course decide to break the ship. Yes, we have a didgeridoo candidate. Though I fancy there probably will be more when that tree comes down. These are trees which died in the 2018-2019 drought. And when the rains come in 2020, they didn't grow back. There's a lot of them like that. And I'm so slow on the uptake that it took the 2018-2019 drought before I worked out why it is that so many of the trees here, although they had green leaves on them, you could see evidence of a dead tree that's been covered up by new growth coming up from the sapwood under the bark, uh, under the under the bark on the roots. I used to call it radial regrowth when I first observed it. Then I learned that it's called epicormal regrowth, and it's a eucalyptus tree's standard defence against fire. You see the big hollow in that. what happens up here on top of the ridge there's only 20 odd meters of vertical elevation above my location here so when the rains fail for a year or two the underground water fails for the trees that have got their roots stuck in a shallow crack in the rock which is not far down here because all these stones sticking out here uh, frost shattered exfoliated basalt that's how close the 
basalt dome is to the surface here. Once upon a time before the coming of the sheep, there would have been about a metre of soil on top of the ground here. But that's all long since dissipated through ring barking and overgrazing and burning and mass wasting, which happened in the 1880s after the gold played out. So anyway, why have we got all these really old trees that have got hollow dead centers in them? And why are there so many edible food plants growing just on this little ridge up here where all the trees, well not all the trees, but most of the trees have pretty much died of thirst once every 20 to 50 years and some of them are a couple of hundred years old. So there's quite a lot of trees that have got tubular living tissue surrounding an absolutely hollow core, which means that when one falls over, you can go around and figure out which ones have died how long ago. And you can see the starting to rot heartwood. You can't always tell from the look of the stump whether there's actually going to be usable didgeridoos in the crown of the tree, but you can more or less figure it out from the pieces of the dead underlying tree that are sticking out. And in this one, I would say that ants have gone in there and just completely hollowed that out. So this is, this is very ready to become a little short didgeridoo, as is this one. This one will take a fair bit more work, but it's probably worth it because it's known to be hollow at the other end. And I think you use a fire hardened, perhaps glowing hot spear shaft to just poke around in there and keep working and keep working and shaking out everything that doesn't look like a didgeridoo on the inside. So for a long time, I've been living up here and wondering how come there's just so many wild native food plants growing around here with heaps and heaps of seeds that you can make flour out of and heaps and heaps of plants that grow berries and heaps and heaps of plants that you can dig up and eat the roots. Why does it come to be? I wondered. And I also wondered why is there so many trees with hollow dead skeletons inside of them? How come the tracky mean in size of wild native parsnips are growing here quite so thickly beside the flax lily, the spike rush? The long leafed mat rush with its parallel sided leaves under the wattle trees. Beside a bit of a creek, which would have been a water hole even back before it was bulldozed. Back when this land was covered with topsoil and grew more each year before the coming of the pale face men. Time and time and time again, I would find not so much on the forest floor as leaning up against a tree, absolutely perfect hollow logs looking for all the world as if somebody had put them aside for later come back to them next year perhaps and of course lots of old stumps axe cut stumps from the original wave of clearing they all tend to be shall we say three times out of four equipped with a hollow center Even this one, which has a twin, which coppiced around the axe cut after it had coppiced from being sucker bashed, I'm guessing. But once upon a time, there was a tree down there. And uh, 
somebody killed it. And these two trees grew up around it and somebody killed them. And this one grew up around it. And look how long it's been there. And it died in the bloody drought. Hollow tree. Tree that just about died in the drought and is now undergoing epicormal regrowth. Making yellow box didgeridoos, if I'm not mistaken, for somebody to come along in a hundred years' time and chip away at it with a stone axe when the tree falls over. I came up with the idea that the reason the food plants are here is because there's so many trees with hollow branches and hollow trunks up here and it's on trap rock country so every now and then when you do get a decent bit of rain after a dry period the mechanical action of the wind in the trees on the wet soil creates subsoil liquefaction of the trap rock and there's going to be a bunch of trees fall over and a whole lot of them are going to have hollow branches. So this is kind of one of those places that I think people have been coming back to for a long time, bringing food plant seeds up here and putting them in the ground and coming back again and again and again. And it was just a nice fantasy and it was nothing more than a fantasy until this wattle tree fell over, narrowly missing my son's spare parts pile for the Brumby that he no longer owns and hasn't for about eight or nine years. And while I was cleaning up from the Brumby, I found underfoot a rock that looked about as flat-ish as that one does. And when I trod on it, unlike that one, which is rock solid, pardon the pun, this one had just a little bit of give in it. And I looked at it and Sometimes you just have to pay attention to doing what you feel like is the right thing to do because instead of just walking on past it as it lay there in the driveway, literally, that's I've been driving backwards and forwards over that for 29 years or something when, when I first noticed the particular rock, I picked it up. And all of a sudden my hypothesis, almost a theory based around the apparently plentiful raw material for making didgeridoos and the apparently observa observably plentiful wild native food plants, if only you could come up with something concrete that indicates that yes, this was a didgeridoo factory. Well, this is what I found. This is the side that was sticking up, flush level with the surface. And I guess I probably noticed that curve there and that curve there and they didn't quite look natural because with exfoliated basalt what you tend to get is sharp edges and flat sides and trapezoidal or parallelograms and this one has obviously had that face sticking up and the moisture has got between it and the one beside it, and on the frosty freezing night when it used to get down to minus 12 or minus 15, the water in the crack has expanded into ice and forced it apart. Exfoliated basalt. And this one has been one of the trapezoidal variety. But somebody has taken to it and flaked a hemispherical cutting of the edge on two different sides in two different sizes. A phenomenon with which I had become familiar, oh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, when I was given a boomerang carving stone, which has a spoke shave, just exactly the right size for rounding off a spear shaft, as well as a cutting edge perfectly proportioned and shaped for cutting the top surface leading edge in the belly of a boomerang and another one perfectly proportioned for doing the blade tips as well as flat edge scraper with which to reduce the thickness of the boomerang and what was once a 
pointed three-faced drill for putting the knock in the butt end of spears with which to accept the drive spike of a Woomera. So yeah, I was already familiar with carefully shaped Aboriginal woodworking tools. So when I found what appears to me to be a didgeridoo spoke shave in stone with two different size cutters. So let's just say I reckon my theory has found an experimental proof to back it up, i.e. stone artifact located, buried on a ridge top which is covered in food plants and proliferates with hollow branches from which didgeridoos can be formed where on suitable didgeridoo type branches have been set up for somebody to come back to and thus I've discovered them when I purchased the title deed and started living here 30 years ago. So, how do you reckon it's going to work? There we go. I can see how that works. And as far as I'm concerned, this one is probably, perhaps, a cutting knots off. But that's, that's just surmise. But this fairly definitely is a didgeridoo spoke shave. I don't know how long it was hiding. But I don't think I would be wrong in suggesting that this pleasant little glade on the edge of a montane swamp on top of a ridge where I've been camping for 31 years. This is indeed tracky mean incisor over the top of flax lily. A bona fide didgeridoo factory on Ngurrabul traditional land. There we go. That is the Ngurrabul traditional homeland and language area. That blue area at the coast is where my father had a holiday house when I were a kid. 500 language groups. For 40,000 years, everybody stayed inside the bounds of their traditional tribal land. And that's where we are, right there. Right there on the end of the dividers is the hut. which you can see there. And on this map, pretty much due magnetic east, right over there, just inside my boundary fence, there is a carved Kurrajong tree, which bears a boundary marker between the Ngurrabul tribal land on which I stand here and the land of one of the tribes of I think the Highland Bundjalung. I'm not really certain on who lived where because uh, where when I grew up I was raised to be a white fella and that means that even though I may well be the custodian of the local old didgeridoo factory as well as the holder of the boomerang carving stone. I can't give anybody what they call a welcome to country, because it's not my country. 
It was my grandfather's charcoal mine. He never brought me up here looking for charcoal, but he brought my older brother, 20 years older than me, up here looking for charcoal after the Second World War up to probably, I don't know, 1958 or so. Um, so yeah, this was where my grandfather used to come looking for charcoal for his blacksmith's forge. But I'm not Ngurrabal. It's not my country. Somebody wants to move from one clan or tribe to the other, to another, as a permanent thing to live there, they don't become a member of the other tribe until seven generations of their descendants have intermarried with the other tribe and then that seventh generation descendant is a member of the new tribe. I've only been here for four generations on my father's side, five in Australia on my mother's side. So I can't give a welcome to country, but I think I would be dishonest if I failed to give an acknowledgement of country. So that's what this is, prospecting for didgeridoos, acknowledgement of country. Well, you have to be careful when you're cutting firewood, otherwise you're going to ruin good didgeridoos. Axe cut stump on a coppice, the other side of which has grown and died and is full of didgeridoos. See the dead branches sticking out through what was the live bark before the current great dying in the drought. I suppose in America this would be called Hollow Tree Ridge. Axe cut stump. Only a little hollow. That's a bigger one. That could have been a ditch. That could have been a ditch. Acknowledgement of country on the didgeridoo factory. The old didgeridoo factory. And I know a bloke who has a mate who asked me to bring him some plausible didgeridoo candidates. So ain't he gonna have fun? There's four counting this one and there's another two at another tree entirely out over that away. So that should do him for a while. Half a dozen didgeridoos. And now Warbles gets to load the firewood and take it to the Dotar child's house before the darkness gathers. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.